Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to continue our discussion on Revelation 12 and 13, where God introduces us to the seven key players of the tribulation, and we're going to be talking about what happens when the great dragon is cast down to earth. Also, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it, and while you're at it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. Not to mention, it really helps the channel when you subscribe. In fact, we are now over 28,000 subscribers and are on the way to reaching a next major milestone of 30,000 subscribers. And I'm asking if you would help us get there by clicking the subscribe button on your screen. Even more, there's something very supernatural that happens in your heart when you step out in faith to let the world know that you've made the decision to believe God's word and stand on the side of Bible prophecy. Also, because people are asking, we are a listener-supported ministry, and you can find out more about helping us continue to share this content all over the world by visiting us at the website on the bottom of your screen. We truly value your prayers, and every financial gift, regardless of whether it's large or small, really helps the ministry. All right, let's jump into our topic for this video, and let me give you a bit of context for what we're talking about and what we've been talking about. Now, we've said that at this point in the book of Revelation that there are a few key things that are extremely important to recognize if you're going to understand how Revelation 12 and 13 fit into the overall narrative of the tribulation. Now, the first thing is this. God is eternal and he's infinite, meaning that from his vantage point, all the events concerning our world, whether they're past, present, or future, exist simultaneously, and they create a single story of redemption and judgment. Now, there's an interesting passage of Scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15, that illustrates the eternalness of God, and it says this, That which is has already been, and what is to be, has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Now, I know this is tough to wrap your head around because as humans, we tend to view things through the lens of time and we're limited to sorting the events of this world into very distinct categories of past and present with the future always being just out of our reach. Now, the result is that our perspective is linear, which creates an illusion of depth, but in the end, all the characters and events of this world converge into vanishing points, and even further, unless God reveals something to us through the Holy Spirit, we have no way of knowing how the spirit world and the natural world intersect in order to shape the future. My point being that when Jesus tells John in Revelation 1.19 to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place, what he's doing is he's telling John that the past, the present, and the future are not isolated from each other and they're not disconnected. In fact, the connection between them is the story of redemption and he's telling John that he is the only one who knows the end from the beginning. Now, the second thing is this. Revelation 12 and 13 are a parenthetical insert into the tribulation narrative that explains the seven key characters and their connection to everything that takes place during the tribulation. Now, this is also significant because Biblically, the number seven represents completeness and the totality of an issue. And in biblical interpretation, there's something that we call the law of first mention, meaning that the very first time something is mentioned in the Bible, the significance that's given to it is critical in understanding its meaning throughout the rest of Scripture. And the number seven gains a large part of its meaning from Genesis chapter 2, where God is presented to us as the creator having absolute dominion and authority over all things. So its implication is really no different in Revelation 12 and 13. Think about it. 
In our text, there are seven key players who are the spiritual influence behind everything that happens during the tribulation, meaning that by right of creation, God has complete, total, and perfect authority in and over these things. In other words, absolutely nothing happens during the tribulation without God allowing it or God orchestrating it, and understanding this is absolutely essential. Now, to this point uh, in our discussion, we've been introduced to the woman, the dragon, the male child, and the angel Michael, which are all symbols that have been taken directly from Old Testament prophecy. And based on that, we've established that the woman represents Israel, the male child represents Jesus Christ, the dragon is Satan, and the angel Michael is pretty much self-explanatory. And we ended last session talking about the fact that at this midpoint of the tribulation, Satan and his angels are cast down from the second heaven, and the earth is subjected to all of Satan's wrath and anger because he knows that he only has a short time left. Which brings us to our text for today out of Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 17, which says this. Now let me read it to you, and then we'll walk through it. Revelation 12, verse 13 and 17 says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood, after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, uh, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I really think that the easiest way to deal with this passage is to simply walk through it verse by verse. Check out verse 13 again. It says this, Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. You know, I think that one of the most important things to take note of is that to this point of the tribulation, Israel has suffered very little political or religious persecution. Uh, in fact, they've been living under the protection of a peace treaty that the Antichrist signed with them at the beginning of the tribulation. But when Satan is cast out of the second heaven by the angel Michael and is relegated to this earth, this consignment to a lower position of authority enrages him, causing all of his anger and hatred toward the Jewish people to come out. And it's here that the Antichrist breaks his agreement with Israel and invades the nation, taking control of Jerusalem and declaring that he's God as he sets himself up in the temple. Now, I also think that it's important to recognize that this invasion constitutes the first true military loss that Israel has experienced since becoming a nation in 1948. Prophetically, this is all part of Daniel's vision concerning the 70 weeks and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a reason a lot of people struggle making sense of this passage from Revelation 12, and it's because they try to insert the church into the text. The problem is that the church has already been raptured, and this passage is specifically dealing with Israel and the Jewish people. Now, that doesn't mean that the world won't be affected by these events, but their focus, or the focus of these events, is centered on Israel. In fact, according to Daniel 9, God's purpose in this judgment is to bring about the salvation of the Jewish people in Israel in order to establish them in righteousness in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So when Satan is cast down, this genocidal rage against the Jewish people is his attempt to stop the word of God from coming to pass. 
Now, let's keep moving through our text. Revelation 12, verse 14 says this, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So when Satan is cast down and attempts to annihilate the Jewish people, God not only intervenes to protect them, he also reminds them of his unfailing faithfulness and the call that he's placed on their lives. Check this out. Exodus 19, picking up in verse 3, tells us this. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, there are quite a few prophecy teachers who speculate that the two wings of the great eagle that carries them to safety in the wilderness could very well be the United States. And they make a pretty compelling case in that the United States has not only stood with Israel since they became a, a nation in 1948, they were critical in Israel actually becoming a nation. Also, the eagle is the national symbol of the United States, and realistically, the United States is the only great eagle nation that has the military capability of airlifting massive, and I mean massive numbers of people to safety, in a very short period of time, which is a fantastic thought. But on the other side of the coin, the possibility is that the United States will change drastically after the rapture takes place because suddenly the tens of millions of Christians who uphold our nation's biblical values and stand with Israel will be gone not to mention the effects on our nation's infrastructure and military capacity from the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments that follow the rapture will no doubt be severe, not just on the United States, but on all the nations of the world. In fact, I also have, I have trouble believing that the United States that we know today will be the same nation three and a half years into the tribulation. And from a geopolitical perspective, at the midpoint of the tribulation, I mean, think about this, uh, so much of the infrastructure of the world has been impacted through these judgments, and there's not a nation that exists that hasn't been impacted by it. But from a geopolitical perspective, at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist has formed an incredible coalition in the Middle East that puts him in control of nearly 51% of the world's oil reserves, which would give him an incredible amount of power on a global scale that could potentially force the United States to back away from Israel and even side with the Antichrist for political and economic reasons. Now, there's an interesting passage in Daniel chapter 8, beginning in verse 23, that talks about the power of the Antichrist and lets you know just really how much power and global authority he actually assumes. It says this, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. See, even today, if the Christian element in our country were suddenly removed, I can't imagine that the majority of those who are left in this country would stand with Israel. Now, regardless, the Bible doesn't tell us one way or the other. Unfortunately, we can only speculate that the two wings of the great eagle that carries the Jewish people to safety in Revelation 12 is the United States 
because the Bible doesn't directly tell us and the United States isn't found in Old Testament symbolism. Now, what we do know is that God promises to protect the Jewish people when Satan is cast down to earth. Even further, the Bible tells us that he's already prepared a place somewhere in the wilderness surrounding Israel where he, where he will supernaturally sweep them to and then continue to supernaturally provide for them during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And to be honest, this deliverance of the Jewish people feels like something that's going to be incredibly supernatural. In particular, since the symbolism we're talking about is connected to the Exodus where God delivered and preserved the Jewish people through a series of incredibly supernatural events. You remember the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and the manna that then appeared every day in the wilderness. Now, let's keep moving through our text. Revelation 12, 15 says this, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And there's an incredible promise given to Israel from the prophet Isaiah that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, uh, and, and most likely you're familiar with the second half of the verse, which says this, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. But the first half of the verse, in particular, when you think about it in context of what we're talking about in Revelation 12, is very interesting. Isaiah 59, 19 says this, So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, which is in the east, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. In other words, I believe that not only will God step in to protect his chosen people, I also believe that the force of this miraculous intervention will cause people from the west all the way to the east, people from all over the world, to repent and turn towards God in a spirit of worship as they see the goodness of God and the deliverance of his people. Now, look at Revelation 12, 16. Let's keep moving through our passage. It says this, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now, remember we've said that in the narrative in Revelation 12, uh, remember we've said that the narrative in Revelation 12 and 13 is uh, symbolic. And this verse in Revelation 12, 16 is another reference to the supernatural moving of God on behalf of Israel during the exodus from Egypt when Pharaoh and his army tried to overtake and destroy the Israelites as they were backed up to the Red Sea. Check this out. Exodus 15, picking up in verse 10, says this. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. See, I believe that this text in Revelation 12 supports a very supernatural deliverance of Israel because God is always faithful to his word. In fact, Psalm 145, beginning in verse 11, says this, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Which means this, it means that God's word can never fail. Now, let's finish out our text for today. Revelation 12, 17 says this, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, when Satan realizes that he can't touch the Jewish people that God is supernaturally protecting in the wilderness, 
many of whom have already given their lives to Jesus Christ, no doubt by the ministry of the 144,000. But in frustration, Satan then turns his wrath towards anyone on the earth that has given their lives to Christ through these events. And I don't think that there's any way to put a number on the amount of people who will be killed by the Antichrist for their faith in Jesus Christ during this time. But I imagine that the slaughter of these tribulation saints is going to be horrific. Yet, even in this, there is incredible victory as these believers in Jesus Christ face this incredible onslaught of the Antichrist and they hold fast to the testimony of Jesus Christ in their lives, even in the face of death. Well, this feels like a good place to stop today. But before you go, I'd like to take a moment and lift you up in prayer. Let's pray. In fact, I can hear the voice of God saying that it's time for my people to shake off every spirit of fear that has gotten a hold of their heart. And it's time to shake yourself off and stop living in fear when you see wickedness increase. Because God says, I have called you and I have anointed you and I have given you the place of being salt and light in the times that you are living in. And I have not left you helpless. I have not left you weak. I have not left you powerless in the face of this great evil. And again, I declare, shake off that spirit of fear and uncertainty because you are not helpless, you are not weak, and my word is powerful for the pulling down and destruction of every demonic lie and stronghold that has taken root in your life, in your city, and in your nation. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to every spirit of fear and I command it to take its hands off your life right now. And I declare, be free in the name of Jesus Christ. Be free in your mind. Be free in your thoughts. I command you in Jesus' name to begin to sleep in peace and stop being troubled in the late hours of the night. And I say, be free in your thoughts and be free in your heart from every spirit of condemnation and every uh, attack that the enemy could bring against you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I break every demonic agenda that has set itself against your life. And I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over you. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over your home. And I release his angels to build a wall of protection over your life that no devil in hell can breach. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel the presence of the Spirit of God. See, you can't live victoriously without the Spirit of God moving in your life. And I can tell you for a fact that the times that we're living in will consume you in trouble unless you begin to push back in the Spirit. So be bold. So stop worrying about what other people are going to say when you start speaking the promises of God over every problem in your life and start taking authority over the enemy and living in that place that belongs to you because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. In the name of Jesus Christ, my friends, be bold in the name of Jesus. And right now be filled from the top of your head to the very soles of your feet with a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I declare these things and I ask these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, God bless. And I look forward to seeing you next time.